whenever we gather, um, whenever we gather members and organizations um, that are competitors together. So we do not anticipate any um, problems today with the content being food safety and government relation or government um, regulations. So jumping into the content. Um, let me explain who FMI is and um, what we do and what we don't do. So we're a member-based trade association representing retailers, wholesalers, and product suppliers. And we um, provide a lot of information to help navigate regulations, help provide best practices for food safety information. I want to have a disclaimer here. We are not the FDA, and we did not write this rule. So this is one of those... All right, this is one of those cases, please do not kill the messenger. Looks like I'm double muted. Okay, um, so the FDA is completely responsible for this rule. We're just trying to break it down and make it a little bit easier to understand and comply. A couple of housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A buttons to submit questions. And we will be sharing the slides and resources. So I'm going to mention a couple resources um, that will be available through SQFI. The slides will be shared. So please do not feel like you have to write down everything that's on the slides. Um, we will make everything available to you. Okay, going into a little bit of background about the rule. So people are talking about the, the new traceability rule. The final rule is new, but we um, the rule has been going on or it has been in development for the past um, 11 years, really. And if I could go back one slide, and I don't seem to have control over the slides. So Leanne, if you could advance for me, that would be great. So this all started when FISMA was passed in um, 2010. Um, President Obama signed FISMA in January 2011. And this was one section in the long FISMA statute. So the FISMA statute was about 80 pages. This is section 204. It was about five or seven pages of that 80 page document. So then we're gonna fast forward to 2014. Um, the FDA published a methodology document for how how should they identify high-risk foods because that's what tracing was was related to is high-risk foods so they published that a lot of comments were received by the agency then we're going to fast forward six more years to september of 2020 um, we saw a um, proposed rule on traceability so the docket numbers there it's the requirements for additional traceability records for certain foods and that's the the rule that we're talking about today because we now have a final rule that was just published next slide so fmi has been deeply involved in this since fisma was going through congress so our um, government relations team and lobbyists were very involved working with Congress, working with the agencies, um, making sure that the industry was represented in FISMA and that things were, were practical, basically. So in 2011 and 2012, the um, industry came together to work on pilot projects. Um, FDA was required to complete pilots for traceability. They contracted to IFT, the Institute of Food Technologists, which many of you are probably members of, IFT did a final report, provided it to FDA, which then FDA then shared it with Congress to fulfill their requirement that was in the statute. I mentioned 2014, we submitted comments on the draft methodology for high-risk foods. Then in 2020, the Leafy Greens Traceability Pilots Report, um, this was actually in response to an action item that was in the Leafy Green STEC Action Plan that was published earlier in 2020, six organizations came together to do the pilots and share the information with the FDA. So that report is available. We also um, commented in 2021 on the food traceability proposed rule. The industry also came together to do traceability workshops through the Food and Beverage Issues Alliance. And then in 22, um, just this September, we met with OMB 
because they were reviewing the final rule and we wanted to reiterate our comments. And then we saw the final rule in November, which was a statutory deadline. Next slide. So let's talk about where to find the final rule and the resources for the rule. So this is what it looks like. It's published in the Federal Register, which is basically kind of the, um, the document portal for all government agencies. And the title of it is Designation of High-Risk Foods for Tracing, Request for Comments and for Scientific Data and Information. And the Federal Register was published in um, on November 21st, 2022, and the pages are there. So if you Google any of that information, you will magically get this document. Um, next slide. So FDA resources are um, available. So the, the rule is available on the FDA website, and they've actually published quite a few resources, which we'll show you some examples of a little bit later on. But you have to, on the, this landing page, if you do FDA food traceability, that's what comes up. And if you scroll down on this page, you will see um, kind of drop down menus. And there's there's a lot of resources. You just have to keep on clicking through to things to find the resources, but they're all available. Next slide. So everyone wants to know, what do, when do I need to comply? When does this become effective? So the publication date was November 21. So everything's based on that date. So just almost a month ago. So it goes into effect in 60 days. So that means it's going to be published in the Code of Federal Regulations in 60 days, so meaning in January. Three years after that is when the FDA can start enforcement of this rule. So that's basically the compliance date. And that's going to be January 20th, 2026. Next slide. So there's two components of the rule. Um, the food traceability list is not codified. So that's not part of what's going to be in the um, Code of Federal Regulations. It is a list that is referenced in the regulatory language, but it's not regulatory itself. It is published on FDA.gov. It is um, going to be updated, they said approximately every five years, and it is the list of foods that require additional record keeping for traceability. So that's the non-codified part. The codified part is requirements for additional traceability records for certain foods. This will be, it, it's always going to be in the Federal Register, which you can access at any time, including the preamble and the rule. And the rule itself will be in the Code of Federal Regulations starting in January. Next slide. So everyone wants to know what's on the list, what's on this traceability list. So this is the list. This is the short um, abbreviated version of the list. The list is actually much longer because there's a lot of examples and a lot of, um, I'll say, clarifying language. But in general, um, there's a lot on it. There's cheeses, um, shell eggs, nut butters. So nuts are not on it. Nut butters are. Um, most produce is on it in the fresh form. So cucumbers, herbs, leafy greens, um, all fresh cut leafy greens, all fresh cut fruits, all fresh cut vegetables, um, tomatoes, melons, peppers, sprouts, um, thin fish, most fish and seafood and even um, crustaceans and shellfish are on here. And then all ready to eat deli salads that are refrigerated. So we'll go through some examples of this, but if you either receive any of these products as ingredients, um, process, manufacture, ship, any of these, then you, you'll want to pay attention to this rule pretty carefully. Next slide. So the examples of some foods, and this is this is our analysis of it. Um, some of these are examples that are given in the preamble. Foods that are on, on the list and under the rules. So things that will have to be subject to additional traceability records. Peanut butter crackers. So peanut butter in all forms, all nut butters in all forms are on the food traceability list. So anything that that in, in product or ingredient goes on or in is on the list. So peanut butter crackers, salad with fresh vegetables, sandwich with lettuce and tomatoes, ice cream with peanut butter as an ingredient, 
Um, so basically any form of, of the products as they're listed on the rule. Things that are not covered, things in their frozen form. So cheese, it was fresh cheeses, but not frozen. So like a pizza with frozen vegetables, frozen cheese would not have to be subject to the, the record keeping requirements on this rule. Frozen fruits are not included. Frozen veggies are not included. Nuts are not included. Canned foods, because they've been processed and went through a lethality treatment. Anything that's been pasteurized is also not included. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of comfort because I think a lot of you might fit into those categories. Um, and this is not a complete list. These are just some examples. So just because you're not on the slide doesn't mean you're in or you're out. I just wanted to give you an example of kind of the the reasoning and thinking behind what's on the food traceability list. Next slide. So the items on the food traceability list are required to have record keeping, even if they're used as ingredients. So foods have to be in the form specified on the food traceability list to be required to have the traceability record. So I mentioned fresh, frozen, all forms of the nut butters. Um, so that's something to just pay attention to. And, and you might, if you have a food on the food traceability list or, or work with one as an ingredient, look closely because there's a lot of extra language there that will kind of help you. Um, other examples, you know, fresh herbs are on there. Dried herbs are not. Um, any kind of thermal or non-thermal processed food, there's a, an exemption for that. So, but you do need documentation. Next slide. So we get a lot of questions about why is this on the list? Why isn't this on the list? These two documents are how FDA made their decisions about what's on the food traceability list. So the one on the left is methodological approach for developing risk ranking model for food tracing for FSMA section 204. It is a document that is dated in September 2022. I think it's about 50 something pages um, and it goes through their risk ranking model. The document on the right is a memo that was published and this is in order to um, explain get the cutoffs. So to explain this is where we drew the line. So that was a memo, um, I think it was dated in October of 22. So I'm seeing the, the title slide So I don't know if we can go back to the slide that we were on. We were on, I think, the last slide in the food traceability list section. Okay, yep. All right, so the memo's on the right side. Next slide. And now we're gonna talk about scope. So the rule requires that and this is a language directly from the rule. It establishes additional traceability record keeping requirements for persons who manufacture, process, pack, or hold foods, which the agency has determined these, these additional requirements are appropriate and necessary to protect the public health. So there's some nuances here that I want to point out. This is very similar to the language we see in preventive controls for human food and also foreign supplier um, vacation for um, the registered facilities, basically. It's very similar to facilities that need to register with the FDA. However, there's a nuance here in that it's the word person instead of facilities. So it's much broader than just registered facilities. It's persons who manufacture, process, pack, or hold food. So this also applies to retail. This applies to restaurants. It applies to um, pet food stores. So it's it's very, very broad and it's beyond the registration requirements for FDA facilities for those of you who are, are familiar with that. Next slide. Is who does this apply to? Who must comply with this? So it's again, persons who manufacture, process, pack or hold food traceability list foods um, 
are required to maintain and provide to their supply chain partners specific information, key data elements for certain critical tracking events and the handling of the food consistent with the, the developing industry consensus approach to food tra tracing. So this is directly from the, the language introducing the rule, but it's so it's persons who manufacture, process, pack, or hold foods and what they're required to, to um, maintain in terms of records. Next slide. Definitions in the final rule. I always look at the definition section because you sometimes the actual regulatory requirements are embedded in the definitions. So let's walk through some of these definitions. And the first ones are gonna be lot code definitions and there's actually four. So traceability lot is a batch or lot of food that has been initially packed. So basically raw agricultural commodity received by the first land-based receiver from a fishing vessel or transformed. So basically what this is saying is traceability lot is a batch or lot of a commodity that's been packed or something that came off a fishing vessel or something that is transformed. Traceability lot code is a descriptor, often alphanumeric, used to uniquely identify a traceability lot within the records of the traceability lot code source. Now we're gonna go with a lot code source. So these build on each other, but all four of them are very important. Traceability lot code source is the place where a food was assigned a traceability lot code. And then the last one is actually an alternative to the source. So this is traceability lot code source of reference means an alternative method for providing FDA with access to the location description for the traceability lot code source as required under this subpart. Examples of a traceability lot code source reference include the FDA food facility registration number for the traceability lot code source or a web address that provides FDA with the location description for the traceability lot code source. So the first two are required and then you can provide a traceability lot code source or the reference to kind of figure out the source. Um, I'm seeing some, some questions here that I can answer really quickly. Um, we're gonna get to kill steps. So the high pressure pasteurization, yes. And you'll see that in just a minute. Um, Storage and distribution is included. So warehouses, cold storage um, facilities, distribution centers are all in scope. Okay, next slide. So these are the big ones and, and you might be familiar with this terminology, you might not, but you're gonna wanna get familiar with it if you haven't heard these terms before. Um, critical tracking event. So it's um, the acronym is CTE. And basically these are events in the supply chain uh, when the food moves. So I'm gonna read it exactly as the definition reads and then we can explain it. So an event in the supply chain of a food involving the harvesting, cooling, um, it should be before initial packing, sorry about that. Um, the initial packing of a raw agricultural commodity other than a food obtained from a fishing vessel First land-based receiving of a food obtained from a fishing vessel, shipping, receiving, or transformation of food. So think of critical tracking events as when food was harvested, cooled, received, shipped, or transformed. That is my way of, of simplifying the, the definition. Um, but think of it in terms of events when the food changes hands in the supply chain. Let's go to the next slide key data elements. So CTEs and KDEs are the kind of the new lingo that you need to, to learn for traceability. Key data elements are the information that's collected at the time of the critical tracking event. So critical tracking events are those times in the supply chain when things, when product changes hands. And key data element is what information do we need at each time, each point in time or each supply chain event. Next slide. Transformation, and this is where a lot of, of your um, certified sites are probably transforming foods or, or receiving an ingredient, you're transforming it into something else and then shipping the transformed item. Transformation, it's really manufacturing or processing. You're changing that food. You're either commingling it, repacking it, relabeling it, 
um, making it into something else, using, you know, fresh herbs, if they're an incoming ingredient, you could be using them in say a frozen meal. Um, it goes out the door frozen. So it's transforming the product. Um, it does not include the initial packing of the food or activities um, at that event. So it does not include harvesting or cooling, but transformation is, I think manufacturing processing facilities are transforming foods. Next slide, receiving. So an event in a food supply chain when food is received by somebody other than a consumer after being transported from another location. So this would be a supplier to a manufacturing facility. You would be the receiver of the product. Um, a distribution center or warehouse would receive product from a manufacturing facility. Um, a store counts as a receiver. A restaurant counts as a receiver. So um, now the, the store selling product to a consumer, the consumer is not a receiver and the store is not a shipper in that case. So it would be DC to store, DC is the shipper, um, store is the receiver. The second part of the definition is important because the FDA um, addressed intercompany shipments as part of the definitions, which is something we haven't seen before. A receiving includes receipt of an intracompany shipment of food from one location at a particular street address of a firm to another location at a different street address of a firm. So basically, this it made it very clear that FDA does not intend to exempt intercompany shipments. If those of you who've been working with FISMA for a while with um, the sanitary transportation rule, they did exempt intercompany inter shipments. This one, they said, nope, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to make it very clear in the definitions for receiving and shipping that intercompany shipment. So this would be a, a vertically integrated company. Every single different address is going to have to do shipping and receiving records. Um, we were not we were not very happy with this one because it just doesn't make sense because the company has the records, but FDA put in the definition, it's very clear that if you ship it from your distribution center to your store, if you ship it from your manufacturing facility to a warehouse, each one has to keep records. Next slide. You can skip forward. Okay, shipping. The event in a food supply chain in which the food is arranged for transportation from truck or ship um, from one location to another location. Shipping does not include the sale or shipment directly to a consumer or the donation of surplus food. And then it, shipping includes sending an intercompany shipment of food from one location at a particular street address of a firm to another location at a different street address. So if you can go to the next slide, we'll break this down a little bit more. So shipping is, is shipping as we think of it, but what it's saying is that in that middle part, shipping does not include the sale or shipment directly to a consumer. Consumer is not, um, you're not required to keep those records on shipping if it's going directly to a consumer. So this would be at the, the store level. It could be a fulfillment center. It could be online orders. Um, sh shipping to a consumer is not shipping, is not required to keep the records for shipping. The next one, it, it solidifies that intercompany shipment again. So we saw it in receiver, similar language here. Shipping includes sending an intercompany shipment of food from one location at a particular street address. So if your warehouse is across the street or you know a block away and it has a different street address, that transfer of the product has to maintain all of the records at the, the CTEs that are required. Next slide. All right, this is where I'm seeing some questions on this. Um, kill step. The kill step is defined as lethality processing that significantly minimizes pathogens in a food. So they did not specify a log reduction. They did not specify any, um, they, they didn't say high pressure pasteurization. They didn't say um, high pressure processing. They didn't say pasteurization. They didn't say thermal treatments. So there's there's a lot, as a food scientist, there's a lot to dig into this. And I would say it's kind of a lay definition of kill step, but I wanna make a couple of points here. Um, they have not required validation. Validation is not required in the regulation. 
also, it was part of a, a webinar that FDA hosted last week, which is available online. There was a specific question about validation and they answered it um, in the, the webinar. So that, that could be considered their official response. Validation is not part of the kill step definition. What is required is documentation that a process was applied that meets the kill step definition. And you probably can think of a number of things that do meet the kill step definition. Um, they do are asking for written assurances. Um, so basically contractual language um, that specifies that you are receiving an item that might be on the, the food traceability list, you're turning it into something. So say like a jarred salsa, you're receiving tomatoes in whole or cup form, you're receiving herbs and you're gonna tr treat it with a the thermal process and it's no longer going to be considered fresh. So you could provide a written assurance, yes, I'm receiving this product, but I'm gonna process it at this, this level. Um, so the example is incoming ingredient is a fresh herb, the facility applies a thermal process. I see in the chat um, some clarifications, dried herbs are not on the FTL. So fresh herbs are, so they would need to be tracked as long as they're in the fresh form. Once they become dried in the process to dry them, they are no longer on the FTL. Another one about cheeses, um, I would look closely at the FTL. Yes, hard cheeses are not on the FTL. They do define it, define it based on the um, the cheese definition, the cheese standard of identity, basically, and the, the, the cheese definition that is used in the Code of Federal Regulations, there's a reference there. So look into cheeses a little bit more because there's a lot there. Um, okay, I'm going to move on after kill step. So what does the rule require? So let's jump into this. So this is actually like the outline of the rule. So I just took the sections that are in the actual codified language. So we're talking about subpart S additional traceability records for certain foods. So section 1.1300, who's subject to subpart S. Exemptions are in 1.1305. Definitions follow traceability plan. We'll talk about that. Um, assignment of the traceability lot codes is next. Harvesting or cooling a raw agricultural commodity on the food traceability list. Packing a raw agricultural commodity on the food traceability list first land-based receiver of a food on the food traceability list from a fishing vessel, shipping KDEs, receiving KDEs, transforming KDEs from KDEs are key data elements. Um, there are a lot of modified requirements and exemptions and waivers, and I didn't list out all of those sections, but there are multiple. There's a record section, which I would recommend reading, and then consequences for failure to comply. So let's walk through some of these. So the traceability plan, and um, a lot of people are talking about this. In general, it's, it's those of you who are um, writing and following SQF code um, and comply and have a certified site, this will be a piece of cake for you um, because it's pretty straightforward and it doesn't have to be updated too frequently. So basically the traceability plan, every facility needs a traceability plan, but this is the information that's required in it. So description of the procedures to maintain records, including format and location. Description of the procedures used to identify foods you manufacture, process, pack, or hold on the FDL. So again, still procedure-based. Description of how traceability lot codes are assigned. So how your facility um, assigns traceability lot codes, your criteria. Statement identifying a point of contact for questions regarding traceability plan and records. Um, so, you know, it, it could be the SQF practitioner, it could be um, QA, it could be a general, you know, point of contact plant manager, but someone who can be a, a contact for questions. Um, for harvesting, a farm map showing the areas with foods on the food traceability list. It also requires each field to be identified with geographic coordinates. One thing I'm struggling to understand is why they required a farm map in addition to coordinates. Um, coordinates are pretty um, widely used, easy to access, and um, definitive. So not sure why they want a map, but they want a map in addition to the coordinates. The same thing with aquaculture. They're asking for a farm map 
that shows the location and name of each container um, for the aquaculture facility, including geographic coordinates. Um, but again, this is a one-time thing and it has to be updated every two years unless something changes. So you do it once, maintain it as a document with procedures and you're good. Next slide. All right, critical tracking events and key data elements are definitely part of the um, of the traceability records. So, and I really want you to kind of start to think this way, critical tracking events, points in the supply chain where product is moved or sold. So that's receiving, shipping, transforming. The data elements are information that's required to be captured as records. So location, lot code, date, unit of measure. Those are all key data elements. Next slide. So this is a spreadsheet that we put together. Um, it, it will be posted on the SQF website. So I know you can't see the words, but I wanna explain the format of this. Um, I have to see things visually. Um, I do much better with spreadsheets than I do with actual narrative language. And I suspect many of you are the same way. Um, so across the top, the columns are the critical tracking events. That's the point that information needs to be shared from one entity to another entity. So, or the same company, but just different facility or different address to different address. So those across the top, we have the, um, the packing, cooling, um, we have land-based receiver of, of fishing, um, we have shipping of food, we have receiving of food and transforming. Down the um, rows, are the categories, so the blue is the categories of KDEs, and then in the middle are all of those individual key data elements that need to be collected at each point in the supply chain. Sometimes it's carrying the information through, sometimes it's adding new information, but this is the master chart that we developed at FMI of KDEs and CTEs, and hopefully you find it helpful. Next slide. Okay, so the critical tracking events are harvesting or cooling a raw agricultural commodity, initial packing of a raw agricultural commodity, first land-based receiver of food obtained from a fishing vessel. So the actual fishing um, event on the fishing vessel is not a critical tracking event. The land-based receiver, so when that, that fishing vessel docks and somebody takes possession of that fish, that's when the critical tracking event starts. Um, I see a question that I'm gonna address right now since we're talking fishing. Coordinates are map, are coordinates or maps required for marine fishing areas? They are not for the fishing vessel, they are for aquaculture. So um, yes, it's, so they're, they're not required for marine fishing areas. Aquaculture, yes. All right. Shipping, receiving, transformation. Those are your critical tracking events. Those are all identified in the rule and very specific. Next slide. I put the categories. You saw the, the Excel spreadsheet where there's a lot of different key data elements and a lot of data that's required at the um, critical tracking events. So these are categories. The rule has all the details. The spreadsheet has the details. So traceability lot code KDEs, traceability lot code key data elements, location key data elements, description of the product, unit and quantity of quantity and unit of measure. So pounds, um, ounces, grams, whatever. Harvest KDEs, harvest aquaculture KDEs, dates, reference documents. And then if you um, process sprouts, there's a whole other section of requirements. So please look at that closely um, if you're in the sprout industry or receive sprouts, you might wanna look at that section also. Next slide. Records are super important and this section requires a close look because this is what you're gonna be um, inspected to basically. So records are required at each applicable critical tracking event. All key data elements are required to be kept as records. So records must be established, and these are some general things that are in the in the rule. 
Records must be established and made, I'm sorry, may be, not must, records may be established and maintained by another entity. So you could have a supplier maintain your records that they ship to you. They can maintain your records as a receiver. You could use a service provider. You could use, um, you know, a consultant, a vendor, but you can have someone else do this for you. Um, records must be available in 24 hours. Off-site storage is permitted if records can be either on-site in 24 hours or accessible on-site. FDA in general has broad authority to request records for lot codes of interest. Um, so they could come to your facility. If there's a food borne illness investigation of a product or food or even ingredient you receive, um, they have broad record authority and they could come and ask for quite a few traceability records within that 24 hour period. That information must be provided to the FDA in an electronic sortable spreadsheet within 24 hours, unless you arrange otherwise. So unless you meet certain conditions, for example, small businesses, um, you know, there's exemptions for religious exemption of, of using the electronic sortable spreadsheet. So they'll work with companies that um, cannot fulfill this requirement. But in general, the FDA is going to be asking for information, the, the KDEs at the different CTEs in an electronic sortable spreadsheet. Record retention is two years. And you, they say you can use existing records. So that is part of the rule that flexibility is there. Next slide, sorry. So a few examples just to run through, and these are um, different, I'll say supply chains that we could think of that would apply to foods on the, the food traceability list. So if you're just a manufacturing facility and you're receiving product in, transforming it and then shipping it out, and you have foods on the food traceability list that you um, receive or ship, these are the critical tracking events that you'll have to have data elements for, receiving, transformation, shipping. Run through another couple more examples just so you can kind of see where you need to be looking. So say you're producing, um, you know, salad kits and you have multiple ingredients coming in, you're kind of transforming it, packaging it together. So you might have harvesting or cooling um, as a uh, critical tracking event. You might pack as a raw agricultural commodity as a critical tracking event. You might ship raw agricultural commodity. And then that processing facility would be receiving, they would be transforming and then shipping. So it can get more complex based on um, kind of where you are in the supply chain, how vertically integrated your company is, how far back you go. Um, maybe someone else is doing the harvesting or cooling a raw agricultural commodity and you're receiving it um, at that point. So just think about it and what you have to pay attention to. A couple more examples. So this would be an example for manufacturing going to retail. So receiving that manufacturing, so say you're a retailer with manufacturing that supplies your retail stores. Receiving at manufacturing, you have transformation, shipping from manufacturing, receiving at a distribution center, shipping at a distribution center, and then receiving at the retail store or restaurant. So you have six different key um, critical tracking events that you're gonna have to have data for. Next slide, um, nut butter processing. So transforming, so the, the nuts are not on the FPL. So the transformation process of nuts into nut butters makes it on the FTL. So you have that transformation is a critical tracking event, shipping from manufacturing, receiving at a distribution center, shipping at the distribution center, receiving at retail. Those are all gonna be on the, the critical tracking events. And the more complex the supply chain, the bigger these, these charts are gonna get. So just, just think about it um, in that terms. So there's, so, Good question here about creating nut butters. The nut butter is on the FTL. So once it's in that nut butter um, in all forms, they did not specify fresh or frozen or thermal treatment or anything with this. So once it's in that nut butter form, that's on the food traceability list. Okay, next slide. 
All right, exemptions. I'm going to go over this really briefly. Um, those of you who have participated in the FDA webinar last week, they went into great detail on this. So if you fall in any of these exemptions, I would read the rule and maybe go back to that FDA webinar. Um, it was held on December 7th. It's posted on their website. But in general, the exemptions are in these categories. Size exemptions based on small um, volume or low sales. Um, we find that these are very, very, very extreme um, low volume. So basically none of our members are going to fit in the, the exempt category based on size. Um, even convenience stores, they exceed it. So look at it closely, but it, um, if you're profitable and growing, you're not going to get a, a an exemption for um, volume or sales. Commingling racks, there's an exemption that applies um, only to shell eggs or, or seafood. So look at the commingled exemption if, if you're in that space. This one is one that most people are probably going to be able to take advantage of. Um, the processing exemption. So kill step or changing the form of the food on the FTL, fresh versus frozen. So the definition was for kill step. Um, and again, the food traceability list, it's in the form that's listed on the food traceability list. So we have you know, the, the fresh frozen, um, there's nothing that's dried that's on the food traceability list. It's mainly fresh. There's a couple of, of instances where frozen is included, especially with the, the um, thin fish. Um, there's frozen is included. So look closely at that. It's very nuanced. And um, I think you just need to figure out what products you have as ingredients, what products you're handling in your facility, and then what products are going out the door. Um, another one is transporters are not subject to this rule. So it's the shipper and the receiver, not the transporter. Um, nonprofit food establishments are also exempt. So, you know, church picnics, your food banks, your um, you know, Feeding America type facilities that are so critical um, to our companies, those are, are not required to comply with this, which is actually very good. The FDA has an online tool. Um, it's exemptions to the food traceability rule and it's on their website. Um, they have touted that it's extremely helpful and thorough. I haven't gone in and tried it, but um, just wanted to share that as a resource. Couple other, I'm seeing these these questions and they're so good. I hope we can get the questions. I need to talk faster. Um, so nut butters, what if they're produced with a retail grocery? So nut butters, nuts are not on the FTL. So a grocery store that's processing nut butters in the store would receive, let's say, peanuts and turn it in. So they're transforming at the store level. That is not covered under this rule because there's a, um, and I can find the exact um, citation, but it's in the transformation KDEs. And it is retail store when the consumer is your next customer, the um, transformation KDEs do not apply. So let me see if I can find that really quickly um, or else I will follow up. Actually, I'm gonna have to follow up because I'm not seeing it right away. So transformation is not required at retail. Receiving is required at retail. Shipping is also not required when the customer is the next in line. Um, so, yep. Yeah, so the next question that I see is, so if the fresh um, food traceability list product is put into something that is then frozen, let's use vegetables on pizza. Vegetables, all fresh cut vegetables are on the food traceability list. As soon as they're frozen, they're not on the food traceability list. So whether that's frozen on a pizza, it's incoming frozen, um, froze, basically frozen fruits and frozen vegetables are not on the FTL. But it's very nuanced and it, it, you have to look. So I'm not gonna say just as a blanket, you know, this is on, this is off. You have to look at the FTL and look at what you're receiving, what you're producing, what you're shipping and see if it's applicable to you. Next slide. All right, waivers are also included in the rule and they're usually upon request and they're complex. So, um, and they apply in certain conditions. We think they're not gonna apply to most mainstream businesses in the food industry. 
Next slide. All right, dates coming up. So let's look at the compliance dates again. I told you at the beginning, but I really, we get so many questions on this. So next slide. So it's three years after the effective date. So it's gonna be in January, 2026. So three years from next month is when the FDA can first start enforcing this rule. Whether or not they will is another story and another conversation, but the compliance date is three years from next month. Next slide. So what do you do? This is what we're getting a lot of questions about, and we have some ideas and some tools. So let's talk through these a little bit. So first, get familiar with the, the regulation. And I know reading a 178-page document is not exactly at the top of everyone's list. Um, the codified section is in the back of the Federal Register Notice. So if you look at the Federal Register Notice, that 178-page document, really the last 11 pages are what's the codified language. So um, go to the back first and then read the preamble. The preamble is the first 160 pages. And the preamble isn't the regulation, but the preamble tells you what FDA is thinking. It tells you um, how they came up with it. So um, I use control F all the time on the preamble. If I'm looking up a specific question, or if you have a certain product and you wanna know what's FDA is saying about that, I could say nut butters. You can go search control F nut butters and see what comes up. Um, I also recommend reading it cover to cover, but know that um, there are ways to use the document that's not just you know reading 178 pages. Also read the definitions. The definitions tell you a lot and that's in section 1.1310. So those are my tips. I look at the codified language. I really look at the definitions and I used control F on the preamble for years to come. Next slide. So we are encouraging you to evaluate your current capabilities. Um, see what you have. A lot of this information might be embedded in um, shipping and receiving information. It might be in ASNs, it might be in payment records. Um, do a gap assessment with your current systems. This is going to be in the interdepartmental. Um, it is going to require um, you, the food safety expert. It's gonna require um, IT, it's going to require supply chain, it's going to require senior management because the resources are going to be necessary. So um, just evaluate where you are, where your needs are, and see what might be missing and um, what you need to comply with. They're not requiring electronic records. You can keep records as paper as long as you can produce that electronic spreadsheet within 24 hours for the FDA if they ask or come up with a reason why you need to give it to them in a different form. Next slide. So next steps, again, some um, just ideas. We included some questions to help you evaluate your traceability system. I'm not gonna read through these. The slides are gonna be shared. So you can look at this in more detail. Next slide. The FDA actually has a lot of great resources. So please look at their website. It's, um, if you, again, if you Google FDA food traceability rule, you'll get their landing page. One of the drop downs is critical tracking events and key data elements. And they have this really great um, visual and it goes through each of the key, um, I'm sorry, critical tracking events, CTEs and tells you what KDEs are required at each. So I mentioned the spreadsheet that we have that will be available on the SQF website. It's on the FMI website for FMI members. Um, this is just another visual representation of that information that might be really simple or even shareable internally in your organizations if you need to do some educating internally. So look at SQFI. We'll post a lot of, of links. I know um, Leanne has some documents to, to share and that'll be available. And then don't underestimate FDA's um, resources because they're, they're really good. Next slide. So this is just the beginning. Um, the, my contact information's there. You, you can reach me through the SQF team. You can reach out to me directly. I'm happy to help. Um, we will be talking about this within the SQF community, 
for the next three years and beyond. Um, so this is not the end of the conversation. This really is just the beginning and wanted to introduce you to the role. And now I will turn it back to Leanne. Whew, thank you, Hillary. <laughs> that was quite the, the discussion. Um, my goodness, that is a lot to digest. And honestly, we have a ton of questions. Um, mainly, I grouped them into what's on the food traceability list, um, who is included um, in this rule, like who would be included, and then the rule itself. So um, I think we have time to about five minutes. What I want to do is just real quick is talk to you about what how this applies uh, compares to SQF. And like Hillary said, really the fact that you have SQF, I mean, you're probably 75% there because you have the traceability plan in place. You already have the means for record keeping. You already have the means for uh, traceability and product identification. It's a matter of complying with the reg. And just like any food regulation, this would be under 2411. So is SQF going to change their code? I mean, I'm not going to say yes or no, but we typically don't change our code to comply with one country's regulation. Because even in the United States, we have two sets of food safety agencies. So, um, and I can't even go into the details as to, you know, what would be the specific, because I thought, oh, I'll walk through an example, but it was, I mean, it depends on so many things, the FTL, the CTE, the KDEs, everything. So um, we really, I think this is going to be a work in progress and we're going to uh, solicit, uh, you know, FMI's assistance as we can put together more examples and walk you through the process. So, um, I mean, I am very fortunate and you all know how lucky and passionate I feel about my job, but when I get to work with Hillary on something like this, I think how lucky are we all to have Hillary in our corner with FMI so that we get this deep down dive into these new regulations and her explanation just follows my thought process and my brain process. So I hope, I hope it was helpful to everybody here. So um, let's go through, if you don't mind, Hillary, just a couple of questions or you've got some time for that. Are you good? Yeah. So let's talk about the food traceability list. Um, are dry fruits included in the food traceability yeah. list? No, yes. only, oh, no. only uh, they're not. Dried fruits are not. Fresh fruits are. So if you are a drying facility and you receive them as fresh, then you would be a receiver. You would have the, the key data elements at receiving, and then you would dry the fruit, then they don't need to be tracked anymore. You could also, if the drying step is a kill step, then you could also um, kind of justify that it's, so you might be able to get out of that receiving step if you do written assurances that yes, I am drying it, it's a lethality step. And so you get out of keeping the receiving. Say, oh. yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that way. But dried, uh -huh. dried fruits and vegetables are not included. It's only fresh fruits and vegetables in the fresh form. So as long as they're in the fresh form, they have to be tracked. Once they're not in the fresh form, they're frozen, they fall off the food traceability list. What about eggs like quail or quail, quail or quail, well, quail, but quail eggs. What about quail? Uh, that is a really good question. Um, shell <laughs> eggs are, I'm going to look it up real quick. Shell eggs are on there and let me see if it's domestic, it's chicken. So quail eggs are not, they are not on the FTL. So this is the nuances that you have to look at. So okay. it's a shell eggs. Shell egg means the egg of a domesticated chicken. So all other eggs would not be on the FTL. Um, the risk ranking model included um, typical consumption. So there was there was like how likely are illnesses, um, how likely is contamination, and then what is the consumption of this? So that's probably why quail, ostrich, whatever is not on here. Um, also, pasteurized eggs are not on here because one that's under USDA, but they've had a lethality treatment. So they're not included, only shell eggs from chickens, domesticated chickens. <laughs> Goodness, okay. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> so there is uh, some other ones that we can get to later, but just in the sake of time. Um, quick question, is there anything on the horizon for products, items that are not on the FTL? Since they just published it in November of this year, they've committed to updating it approximately every five years. So I think we're, we're good for a little while. It's not gonna change immediately, 
Um, but if we do start to see like, you know, I'm old enough that I remember, you know, when peanut butter, it was a surprise that peanut butter could actually, you know, have be contaminated with salmonella. So, you know, when I was in school, we would have never thought that peanut butter would be on the FPL. So things change, <laughs> different <laughs> organisms, yeah. you know, yeah, that's why we're going to be employed forever. Yeah, but, right. um, <laughs> it's all of us are, <laughs> but you know, it, it could change at any time, but right now the FDA is um, committed to updating it about every five years. And I think there's a requirement for how long you would have, if they do change the food traceability list, um, how long you would have in order to start tracking it. So it okay. would not be an overnight kind of thing. Like, oops, tomorrow you have to start tracking this. It's okay. not going to be like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's shift to who is included in this rule. So yeah, I think you answered storage and distribution is or it's is It's really, not. they are. So, okay. so anyone who manufactures, processes, packs, or holds food, including retail food establishments and restaurants, and the restaurant defini definition, which I did not go into, even has veterinarians and pet food stores. So like your pet smart is subject to this rule if they have fresh foods in the <laughs> food. So um, yeah, it's, it's very, very broad. It's much broader than the FDA food facility registration requirements. And it's, it's more than what we think of as typical um, supply chain. So it really it's, it's everybody in the food industry. Wow, it's like an onion. You just keep peeling back. It, is, it, even, <laughs> it even applies to foreign establishments that are sending food to the United States. So it's it's okay. very broad. Um, what about a laboratory? Does a lab count as a receiver? Um, it depends on what they're doing with the food. If the lab is only running samples and the food's not going to be consumed, then no, they're not a receiver. Um, there's also some exemptions for um, you know, like... Uh, food that's basically not in commerce. So, and that's in the exemption section. Okay. Um, so now let's get into the rule. There's some questions here about okay. the rule. Um, okay, number one, if an item is on the FTL, goes through a kill step, does that exemption documentation have to be held at every level step in the distribution? Um, how many entities are responsible for storing that information on the kill step? So once it's it goes through a kill step, you're like, well, you're done now, but where, do, how does it work with the tra tracking and tracing? So once it's through a kill step, then it does not have to be tracked anymore. The question is, are you a receiver of the product in its, in its fresh state, basically, um, prior to it going to, through a kill step? And there's an exemption for that in the exemption section. And the exemption requires written assurances between those supply chain partners. So it's worth a close look at the exemption section for that. Definitely. What if an item that is baked by the receiver before sale to the consumer? So it's received and then it is, so the receiving is the step that has to be tracked. So receiving of items on the FTL that baking steps so say it's a retailer that's that's you know baking something and it's going to a consumer if that consumer is the next person in the the supply chain consumers can't be shippers or receivers um, and retail and restaurants are not required to document or keep records on transformation so it depends if it's a, a commissary or central kitchen or manufacturing facility that's doing the baking then they would be receivers they bake it needing a kill step and then it's off the FTL or the store does not have to document transformation. They just have to document receiving. Yep. Got it. Um, so here's a question. If you are already FISMA compliant with the traceability rule, are you compliant to this new rule? So this is the new rule. So this, yeah. this rule was just published in um, November, it came out on November 21st, last month of November 21st, 2022. So um, if you're, if, if you've been able to implement in the last three weeks, great, we would love to learn how you did it. But this, this is what you'll have to be compliant with. Um, the proposed rule was published two years ago, 
but they made some changes that if you're compliant with the proposed rule, which hopefully you didn't put forth too much effort to be compliant with that, um, then you need to look at this final rule and see what you need to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and this is regarding assigning the internal lot number. Do we have to assign an internal lot number? Can we use the supplier manufacturing, uh, that man supplier manufacturer lot number? Yep, and this is specified in the rule. So there are certain um, points in the supply chain where lot numbers can be assigned. And there are also points where they cannot change. So they can basically be changed with say repacking or relabeling any kind of transformation. But there's certain points where FDA doesn't want you to change that lot number or you have to keep two. So the transformation step, you have to keep the receiving lot number and you also have to assign a new one and maintain that lot number. So there's a lot of nuances around the lot numbers. And I think that's why there's four definitions for, for um, traceability lot codes. So that's worth a, a deeper dive into that. Yeah, that's where my biggest uh, mm -hmm. questions are is how that is generated and then maintained. So good, good answer. Thank you. Last question we have, and then um, I have everybody's questions. So we'll create an FAQ and post these on there. So um, if we didn't get to it during this webinar, we will certainly provide the responses in that FAQ. So last question is um, in regards to distribution centers, if your company ships to a DC that is not part of your company, do you have to keep records of where the DC sends the finished product? Can you read that again? Yeah. In regards okay distribution centers, uh -huh. yep. if your company ships to a DC that is not part of your company, so a third okay. party distribution center, do you have to keep records? Does that company have to keep records to where that DC sends the finished product? So in short answer is no. You have to keep records of your shipping to the DC. The DC would have to keep the records as a receiver but then you're not expected to keep records further down the supply chain. So basically it's, it's I don't wanna say it's still one up one back, but you're responsible for your records for where you are in the supply chain and you, you're you not required to keep records that you don't have access to. But does the, where does the DC, so let's- The DC is a shipper, their receiver, their mm -hmm. receiver and a shipper. So then and they, they have, have to, to know where, they're, where, the, where the product's going from there. Stores are also receivers, so that so you have with with manufacturing, they're a receiver, transformation shipper, going to a DC, they're a receiver, they're also a shipper, and then it's going to retail, either store or restaurant, and that's going to be a receiver. Yeah, perfect. But everyone keeps their own records, and everyone's responsible. Even if you outsource it, you're still responsible for compliance with the rule and making sure those records meet the expectations of the rule. Yes, that makes sense. Wow. There's still a lot. So I, I think I like your, your one slide, which is like, this is just the beginning. So yeah. I think that uh, totally makes sense. So I just really, again, here's Hillary's, uh, you know, information and just want to thank Hillary with all the insight and knowledge that uh, she shared with us today. Um, we will continue to share information on the Traceability Act. The more or the traceability rule, the more that um, the information, the questions that we have, we'll um, put together an FAQ list. We'll continue to, to work with Hillary and her team in, in building new tools. And again, all these resources are gonna go on our website. So uh, look for this recording as well as the slides, um, that Excel spreadsheet or that one spreadsheet that Hillary uh, generated is a gold mine, let me tell you, um, and valuable. So uh, we'll post all that information along with the links regarding um, FDA and where you can get some more information. So we'll close this webinar today. Again, many thanks to you, Hillary, for your insight and knowledge. We greatly appreciate it as the SQF community kind of check is uh, is attacking this role. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.